Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Farmhouse Podcast, where we sit down and talk to innovators and entrepreneurs about their journeys in hopes to inspire our listeners and maybe we'll learn a thing or two ourselves. Today, we have two of the leading experts in the country on, uh, on the dance between big and small, and we're really um, proud and honored to have them with us today. Um, to my left is Dean DeBias, he's chairman of Reboot Partners, which is devoted to um, creating that bridge between startups and large corporations in the name of innovation. And Sonny Gark, he's um, Chief Information and Innovation Officer at a tiny little itsy bitsy company called Exelage. Uh, very small, only 20 billion in sales and 25,000 plus employees. Um, to get things going, um, why don't we just ask each of our guests in turn to talk about your own experiences uh, in this dance between big and small and what you've learned so far. So we'll start with you, Dean. Go ahead. Well, I'm a bit of a hybrid. So um, my background is uh, rebooting multinational corporations, either at the operating level or as an advisor or board member, um, as well as working with emerging growth companies to help them scale. And what emerged out of that is a dancing with startups program where we bring massive multinational corporations together with startups to accelerate their growth and innovation and whatever it needs to. So so I tend to play in a very uh, very strange hybrid hybrid role and uh, startup thinking is a big part of it. Startup thinking, entrepreneurial innovation, and getting people to be more entrepreneurial inside corporations or just partnering with the startups if the culture just needs to be a part of the people outside of the company. So I think this is a hot topic you can see it really expanding on the next couple. Sonny, how about, how about your background and, and how did you, uh, what made you so interested in this, this uh, juxtaposition between big and small and how to bridge the two? So, uh, you know, I'm at Exelon, we are a very big company, we, uh, and we're in the energy business. And if you think about it, and I always joke that if you brought back Alexander Graham Bell today and you showed him an iPhone, he would have no idea what that thing is. <laughs> Chances are you could bring back Thomas Edison and he could probably work it Exelon today. I mean, our industry is. I changed. hope it get a job, Sonny. He's got I, I, pretty good credentials. He does have a. Pre- well, I don't know. We'll see where his school is. <laughs> Probably pass the background. Right. 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 Exactly. But our industry has changed that little, and we are at that inflection point right now, where a lot of disruption is coming into our industry in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. And so, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the changes, a lot of the opportunities are happening outside of the company. So we have to find a way to bridge our world with that innovative world and as part of that make our world more open to innovation. We don't necessarily have to be the R&D engine, but we have to be open to the external R&D and what people are doing in a way that we can find the opportunity within Exelon. So let's talk about um, what startup thinking is and and what it means to you. Um, The the term entrepreneurship has become very uh, popular. I don't know personally if I love that term. I know. I think Dean, you actually hate it. Hate that word. Oh, because I used to be uh, one. It's such a <laughs> right. I love that word because I am one. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, Farmhouse is an entrepreneur engine within Leo Burnett itself, yeah. and we help our, our clients uh, uh, behave in an entrepreneurial way. But um, let's talk about what startup thinking is to you. So, Dean, what what is that? What does it actually mean? It's Startup thinking is it's more entrepreneurial in nature, and that is very foreign to big companies. So one of the reasons I don't like the word entrepreneurial is that it, it, um, it just uh, entrepreneur in residence is something that I was uh, when I was a kid starting out a business, helping you know big companies start little companies because it, it's just fraught with problems. Large corporations love to say to you, hey, Paul, take this new job. We're going to take off the guardrails. Feel free to fail, go faster, jump higher, don't worry about it. And the first sign of trouble, they get amnesia. They're like, who the heck is Paul? I don't You're know what failing. he's doing. What do you he's do? out of control. Right. Jeez, we got to do something about this guy. So that the, the reason I don't like the word entrepreneur is if you look it up on um, uh, the internet uh, like a year ago on Wikipedia, it came up as an orphan because yeah. it wasn't filled out. And metaphorically, it is kind of an orphan. So companies are learning how to support and, and actually use that role in a way that actually can get something done in the corporation. So some of some people can actually move the needle. But to give them the freedom and the depth and the breadth and some rules, I think what they what they need is kind of funny. They need a little bit of a structure to something that should be completely unstructured, which is entrepreneurialism and, and being able to do things inside the company. So I always remind people, I say, listen, are the people that you've empowered to do this, are they acting really like a startup would be in the real world? Or are they always coming back to you and asking for permission? 
do they feel free to compete with the mothership? And you should answer is like, no, it's, it's more like an experiment. So right. partnering outside of the corporation is very important. So, so the startup thinking to me is not just embedding people inside the company and helping you set up scum works, but it's also helping those people go out and partner with other people on board, whether they're entrepreneurs in the basement or people over at 1871 or people that have a real up and running company. It's like, how do you do deals with those guys or embrace them to help you become more entrepreneurial on the inside? Sonny, what is startup thinking to you? So it's, it's, a, it's a great question and it's one that we are grappling with internally, right? And so I think, first of all, you're right. We run the largest fleet of nuclear power plants in the country. We do not want people running around innovating and being entrepreneurs in terms of how you run those, right? We have very specific processes about how you do that to keep it safe and reliable. Right. Same thing with the other pieces, of the other parts of the grid and transmission and distribution. I think the way we're starting to think about it is, first of all, there's a difference between innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And what do you call it, startup thinking or any other thing? I mean, all those words are kind of messy words anyway, right? I mean, they're, I mean you can kind of put whatever definition you want around those. but. I think what we're trying to do within Exelon is two things. One is think about innovation as how do we do what we do today better? And, use, right. and, and that might be bringing in external technologies and looking for those opportunities. And we do want everybody in the company then to be open to doing things differently. And at least be open to trying something, right? And you, and you try it in a, in a way that, as Dean was saying, you're not like, hey, go fail, everybody can fail. No, you can do it in a contained way right. to see if it works. And then you can figure out how you can scale it. Right? But you've got to have that willingness within the company to at least try things. I think entrepreneurship is different, you know, because it's a different skill set. It's a different way to think about a problem. It's a different way to think about new products and even new business models. And how you go and you scale those within a company, I think, has a lot of different challenges. Everything from how do you ideate to find these things, to how do you, how do you invest in them, do a proof of concept, grow them, and get them to the point where they are at scale. And I think within the company, you have to be thinking about providing the, the protection along that entire continuum. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just like, hey, you're a bunch of entrepreneurs, the really the hard part is, is who's actually deciding it's a good idea? Who's actually deciding when to put capital in? Who's actually deciding when to scale? So we did create a team called the Emerging Technologies Team. And their job is really twofold. One is they go out to the external ecosystem and they try to understand what's out there. What are these technologies that are being developed? What are these products and services that are... So we may spend a day at 1871 and, and meet with a whole bunch of companies. We're gonna go out to Baltimore and look at a whole bunch of cyber companies. And their job is to really build up that relationship in a much more intentional way with the external ecosystem. Because what happens in big companies is a lot of it just becomes purely serendipitous right. and, and random and ad hoc. So we're trying to put a little structure around that without creating a bottleneck. Applied serendipity. If Applied you serendipity, right. you know? Um, you know, more like eHarmony. I don't know, right? I mean, so a little <laughs> yeah. more, you know, take a little, put a little science to the art. Um, and then the other piece of their job is they need to understand the business well enough to, to, to be that broker between, okay, here's a really interesting new technology. Can we use it somewhere in our business? And then can we pilot it? What's and, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, so let me just give you a quick example yeah. of this because it's kind of a fun one. And it, it's, it's, and it's a great example of, of the culture that Dean was talking about around how quickly you forget what you've already decided that you've given people permission to do. Amnesia. Amnesia. So I, you know, we built this emerging technologies team that, that was kind of, you know, they're under me. I was excited about it. I'm proselytizing within Exelon that this is the way to go. I walk in one day, the team comes up and they're like, hey, we bought these double robotics things. And they're just basically an iPad on, a, on wheels, right? And they're like, it, it's like a Sheldon bot if you watch Big Bang Theory. And, and they're like, yeah, you should just use this and use this at the executive committee. Don't even go to the executive committee. Just send this up there instead of yourself. And I was like, what are you doing? You're going to get me fired. This is the you craziest. You created a monster. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this is the craziest idea. Like, how, much, how much did it cost? They're like, well, each one's 2,500 bucks. It's only. But I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get fired. We're trying to do something. And they're like, look, you told us we could fail. And I was right. like, oh, I did tell you that. <laughs> right. Turns out that they went out to one of our new sites. And one of the big issues is, you know, you try, you have to go into highly radi radiated areas. You have to be very careful about that. You've got dosimeters. You're measuring the amount of radiation, both at an individual as well as a collective level. They were able to use these, these, ro these double robotics to replace people. So rather than a group of five of making this up go in, two people went in. 
And the other three who weren't necessarily going to actually do anything but more observe and provide guidance could stay outside and communicate and see what the other folks were seeing. Simple idea, simple kind of opportunity, but it was one, again, where you needed somebody to play that broker role between the external opportunity and the internal opportunity and to kind of try to marry those up. Well, it sounds to me like you're cre trying to create a culture where it's okay to try new things. You know, Farmhouse is, um, is an operating unit and it's a practice and all these things, but it's also yeah. a permission slip. Right. You know, it's, it's a way for the company to say to its employees and its partners, we want you to try new things and here's a place to go for that. But the permission slips also come with detention slips and there's all kinds right. of slips here in school. Right. The, uh, so what I usually, I'm asked to sometimes help corporations, how do we set up an incubator inside? How do we become entrepreneurial? So it's all about the culture, and you pick one that fits. Like, hey, should we embed these, these entrepreneurs? Should we set up a separate site somewhere else? But back down to the core point, it's like you're trying to do two things at once to, to, to reflect on Sonny's point. It's trying to replicate the thrill and speed and chaos of a, of a, of a startup. At the same time, keep the discipline, the, that rigor of, of a, a disciplined turnaround, of how they would you know, literally go in and turn around a company. And blending those two, is a very tough thing to do because one usually counteracts with the other. So I, I, in order to keep the detention slips from coming, I typically will walk people through that and say, okay, let's just take a scenario. This could happen, this could happen. So you need some discipline, adult supervision, not CFOs, but people like you that are you know, good seasoned business guys. And you need the kids to be able to do what they need to do. And the two tend to kind of marry up after they've gone through a couple exercises like, like the, the expensive iPads. And right. they, and, he just happened to find an aha application. Another outcome of that could have been he's really mad and he gives someone a detention slip for spending too much money. But once they get through that first one, we kind of say, okay, listen, how do we correct this? How do we allow you, Farmhouse, how do we allow you to be more, um, you know, to have more swagger and do your own things and compete with the mothership sometimes? Because that's what all the startups are doing out there. They're not worried about how your CEO feels. And you almost need to empower your people to do that a little bit. And at the same time, you know, keep some rules about, okay, don't go near the nuclear power plants. Interesting you talk about the idea of, of a corporate innovation program competing with its parent. That's a fascinating idea. We're trying to get people, going back to the culture idea, going back to this isn't an industry that's seen a lot of innovation, to start understanding that they're at risk, that disruption is happening. And so Rob got up and said, you remember Kodak? Remember that company? You remember right. Pan Am? You remember those companies? And so this whole question of, and he used that exact same line, keep the cannibals in the family. So it's something that we are thinking about, right? And so we want the required reading for everybody to be Clay Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma, right? And, and what is The Innovator's Dilemma? Well, The Innovator's Dilemma is, is sort of that, like, uh, you know, when there is this competition coming in, how do you remake yourself from within? And can you remake yourself? And what I really like about Christensen's work is, you can look back at a Kodak or any of these companies and say, well, those guys were fools, they were idiots. And that's not, that's not the case. There are a set of processes, incentives, rewards, structures within companies that sometimes make it very difficult for them to adapt and change. And so what looks like to them they're making the rational decision in the long term is not optimizing for themselves. And so you've got to really be looking at all those layers and understanding that. And that's why I think this idea of Sometimes it's, it's so hard to recognize and you don't really know that that's why sometimes you do say, look, we're just going to go create something outside um, and just give it the freedom because even if you think you've thought about everything internally, you may not have. No, of course not, by definition. But better to cannibalize thyself. So I, I was just out in Silicon Valley yesterday where I met with three companies that are going after Netflix. I mean, there is always that mm -hmm. desire and that urge to say, yes, they have, you know, upset the market and they've disrupted it, but we can take the next move there. So if you look at what Blockbuster didn't do, is it didn't give people permission to cannibalize themselves. Um, because, so it's best not to use that word, I find. <laughs> right. it's, it's used, come up with another word. Disrupt is not a good word anymore. Um, it isn't? You don't want to disrupt your board or the CEOs. That's like the game corporations play. That's exactly what they should do. Disrupt yourself before you try to disrupt the market. But yeah, with Blockbuster, it was like, oh, geez, uh, we don't have permission to go out and create an alternative service. So a couple issues they had was, you know, there was this skunky little company in Silicon Valley that was, you know, shipping discs in a mailbox. So they were like, gosh, didn't AOL just do that? They're out of that business now. We're not shipping discs around anymore. Okay. So they kind of ignored Netflix for a while. And then when stuff started to go online, they tried to catch up, but they didn't. 
they were worried about the cannibalization of the stores. And many of your clients are worried about the cannibalization of retail going online. And at a certain point, you know, Target goes, we have to jump in here because people are buying toilet paper on Amazon and we need to figure out what's their strategy here. We need to partner with some startups that have the right technology. Yes. So our shopping cart is the best in the world. And we can convert and migrate customers and steal it from other people and not worry about reducing our store traffic. That is how you kind of address cannibalism. You just paint the picture says, do you want this guy to do it or do you want me to do it? Hey, well Mr. Be us. CEO. Exactly. And they usually give you some political answer, but eventually, you, at least you're getting the conversation started. You understand but, where the market's going. And I also think that it's a question of business models, right? I mean, Blockbuster had a certain business model. Netflix had the original business model of we're going to mail it to you. Then it was a streaming model. Now it's a content model, right? So part, part of the history of big companies has been you find kind of the big the business model, and then it's about economies of scale and creating barriers to entry. It's right. not necessarily about iterating on that model into something different. You're just trying to maximize that model. Exactly. And I think that's where it becomes really interesting and hard when it comes to this idea of, I, I, I know whether you use the word cannibalization or disrupt, it's really a more rapid changing in the business model and in a physical infrastructure world where once you kind of established yourself as the leader, it was really hard for other people to get into that model, really hard to be competitive with you, and then you were all about process and efficiencies, yes. right? And versus trying to say, there's a different model here. And I think that's the piece that, that corporations, everybody needs to be looking at is, what's, is, is there a different business model, not just a different product or a different service? So it's about business models, culture, but sometimes uh, deeper words like, you know, uh, I don't want to even say it, but uh, if you really look at that and then they bring up the keyword, well, let's iterate on this. Iterate to them sounds like irritate. This is irritating. <laughs> I don't want to even consider this. Well, it's going to happen. I mean, take the blockbuster thing one step further. <clears throat> Netflix finally got to a point, Reed Hastings said, yikes, I'm a startup, I'm great, I've got the best technology people in the world. He admitted publicly that we don't have an algorithm that's going to let us grow anymore. This is a few years ago. And couldn't get his engineers to come up with the best one. And rather than you know just saying, oh boy, we just have what we have, they said, what's the best way to iterate? Let's throw it out to the, to the, um, you know, the share universe and see who can come up with an algorithm that'll help us recommend movies and things. So he threw this out to the you know, ecosystem, gave a million dollar prize, but the funny thing is, is the final formula was developed by corporate people at AT&T. Right. So <laughs> release right. your people. Yeah. Exactly. These were corporate people that won the prize. <clears throat> to all people listening to this podcast, Dean has just declared you released. So we were releasing <laughs> the people. I'm mean, imagining you mass chaos in the streets of Chicago right now. Let's talk about a very important word that, that both of you have mentioned, and it's culture. How do you create a culture of innovation within a large corporation? It's, it's an essential question, right? And I think the first thing is understanding that you have to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's not something you just say, oh, we're going to be more innovative. Let everybody go yeah, be more innovative today and right. go figure that out. Hire right? some consultants. Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. it, it doesn't work that way, right? It does, and because you have a set of processes, incentives, structures, that have gotten you to where you are. And, and that's been very intentional, right? You have built a very intentional set of processes for efficiency and, and your bonus system and your comp system and everything else because you're saying, if I do all these things, I get this outcome, right? And so if you don't think about that as well, that, that every part of that in terms of what you're trying to get the outcome of innovation, you're not gonna be successful. So you have to start and look at, okay, well, what today, what are we doing to reinforce the idea of innovation, if anything? And I think a few things that you need to do at a minimum, one is, is your leadership has to demonstrate that they're committed to this. And demonstrate it not only in words, but in action. Somebody told me a while back, people know, leaders sometimes don't think that their people know how they spend their day, but they know exactly how they spend their day. Right. right? And if you're spending 99% of your time on operational efficiencies and less than 1% on innovation, what do you think your people are gonna spend their time on? They're not gonna care about it. So they need to see that you're spending your time on this, that you're going out and looking at new companies and thinking about new ideas and, and pushing for change within. Because they're gonna take their cue from you, right? That's one. Two is, you have to, a lot of times, companies don't have trusting environments, right? And a lot of times, the risk to action is greater than the risk to inaction. Yeah. And so you've gotta create an environment and a culture that says, look, I'm gonna trust you to go do something different. And I'm not going to beat you up when it doesn't work. Going back to Dean's point, you want permission and detention slips. And the way you kind of get around that is 
you're not making million, 20, 30, 100 million dollar bets. You're just making, you're trying to do things quickly and learn and fail quickly or succeed quickly so you can iterate. What are the elements of a startup culture that can be inserted into a, a larger corporation and corporate innovation program for the better? And what are elements of the startup culture that probably should be kept out of corporate America? So um, let's go back and answer the other question you asked first, which because um, so, as, as an no answer that one. as an <laughs> I'll probably forget it yeah. by the time right. I get around to it. As an operator, so I've stepped into a lot of turnarounds as the CEO, and the hardest thing, the biggest decision to make is will I transform the culture or not? There is a decision to be made there. Sometimes you don't have to transform the culture. Sometimes you'll waste all your time on it versus growing the company in, in different markets through different groups. So I look at three things, people, platform, and passion. So on the people side, it's making a decision about what are the next generation of talent I can bring in here, and how do I retain these people engaged with everything Sonny just said, critical that that mix gets going, including incentives and everything. On the platform, that's the core. What products and services are we gonna get in and get out of? What are we gonna put on our hot list? What are we gonna put on our hot list? That's where you start changing all of the culture, because yeah. like you said, you're putting money where your mouth is, you're saying, we're not doing this anymore, we're doing this. And then the passion is not what you think. The passion is around developing a mindset about everybody's focused on revenues or profit or something, but we're getting people revolving around certain goals and we're incenting them and comping them and, and, and considering getting them to consider most of their time on those goals and getting them aligned. So it kind of answers your other question is, what do startups do that these big companies don't do? Well, they're unencumbered, first of all. And rather than everyone having separate department goals, you know, Sonny's got this efficiency goal, and I'm the CMO, I've got to do this stuff, and it kind of conflicts a little bit. As a CEO, I always want a little bit of tension there, right? With a startup, it's like, well, we have one goal. It's to kill, you know, Netflix. Right. And that single-handedly is, is the most important thing. There is a mission, there is a vision, there is a strategy, and there is an absolute passion about that's what we're going to do. When you get over 100 people, you start to lose that. That's why you see startups, even when they get into the you know, two, three hundred people thing, starting to acquire other companies, they start to lose that passion a little bit. So one of the things I find is injecting back into big companies, it's like, hey, how do we take, forget the culture for a minute, I'm going to go into this department and I'm going to say, listen, forget about all your, your MBOs and all this nonsense. You all have the same goal. This is it. It's the, and it's not about increase this by this amount. It's like, take this market position from that competitor. I'm not telling you how to do it, let's do it. That's how you're all are judged and paid and whether or not you're gonna stay here for two years. It is the most frightening thing to give corporate employees. So you have to pick the right ones that'll get behind that and go, this is great. You know, the other third of them might not get it, but they'll come along for the ride. So single-handedly, trying to get them focused on one mission is a very tough thing to do without changing the culture. It's fascinating because the, you, you think about startups as being very fluid and you know the pivot. You know, there's a lot of every for a, a, a long time that. last year, um, you couldn't pick up Fast Company or any other, any other magazine without reading about the pivot. What you're saying is, think twice about the pivot. Stay focused, and that's what you know is a hallmark of successful startups that that big companies can learn from. People uh, like to talk about the pivot because they get into situations and they go, ah, oh, they discover something else, and they. And it's easy to make fun of corporations because they don't know how to pivot. A pivot to them is like, you know, how do we turn around the steamship? It's like, right. well, first you got to put the rope on, then you got to turn the ship, and then we just broke the dock. You know, all kinds of things going. Whereas the startup is, but that's just a condition of something that they found opportunistically and needed to pivot into, or it was recognizing the failure and getting up and changing it, and moving on. Most corporations aren't good at that. Most cities aren't good at that. Chicago is still yeah. a city that entrepreneurially doesn't get to pivot. It's like, well, you kind of failed on that one, so right. we don't not so sure about you. It's like, and in the Valley, it's a badge of honor. It's like, right. wow, you screwed that up. That was awesome. Can you come do this one now? Because you've really learned a lot from that. We need your skills here. We really need your help. And of course, there's a fine line between a pivot and being really distracted. <laughs> so, right. and you, you know, companies need to stay on the right side of the line. Let's change course a little bit. I want to talk about the right mix within the corporation between making innovation or buying it. So how do you how do you decide what you're going to create internally and what you're going to just go out into the marketplace and acquire and how do you make decisions between the two? And what's the right, what's the right balance if you're to do a, a hypothetical pie chart of the two activities? Sure. It's a tough, it's a 
tough balance. Um, and I'm sure there's no right answer, but how do you think about You know, I mean, you and I teach together at Kellogg, so I, I'm a big believer in my build, buy, borrow formula yep. of, you know, at least vetting it through that funnel. And, and, and most CEOs, they jump to the buy button. We'll just acquire this company. Uh, most of the people have been there a long time, but they just love the build. Like, we'll build it, and it'll be ready by April. And I go, really? What year? And April says <laughs> so they've got to be ready. Right. So I push them heavily into the borrow, which is a fancy word for partner. Huh. And working with outside companies to get stuff done so it doesn't have to be a build or buy question. But more specifically, it's about what are you trying to do? Incremental product development or extension, a lot of the things that you deal with with, with clients, or you're actually trying to come up with a way to change your market and shift something in. Chances are you guys don't have really a good track record of that, so you should go out and partner with someone. And I just find if they're doing more partnering, they get better at acquisitions over time. They get better yeah. at buying them and nurturing them versus killing them. So, you know, Sonny, yeah, yeah, interesting to get your perspective. No, no, but I think, that's, I think that's right, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's one answer. I don't think there's kind of one answer to say, okay, well, this is, it really comes down to, as Dean was saying, versus what are you trying to achieve? Right. And based on that, then you can maybe go through that build, borrow, buy, right? And to figure out what's going to give you the, the highest probability of success. Because if you're just trying to achieve maybe something incremental, maybe that's something you can just build yourself, right? If you're trying to do something very different, then again, you're going to, you're going to be busting up against the culture of the place and the bureaucracy, then maybe that's something you either borrow or you buy, right? right? And so I think it, a lot of it depends on what you're, what you're, out, what you're trying, what success looks like. And I think, again, for big companies, my sense is it's, there's no silver bullet, there's no easy answer, there's no kind of like, we're gonna create this department, it's gonna solve. It's all about intentionality and, and honesty. Yeah. And understanding what is it you're trying to achieve and can you do that or not? And then be honest with yourself about whether you can and, and that's where we, I think we run into trouble is a lot of times we just think we can do it and the answer might be we can't. Um, and, 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 but I think, real quick, I mean, Corporations aren't, they, they know this, they understand this. And I think it's just changing the way they think about it a little bit, right? And I go back, I spent a number of years in supply, so in supply chain. And you do the same thing in supply chain. You figure out, am I gonna build or buy? And, and but you do, that at, you do that analysis, and you figure out, okay, what's gonna be most competitive for me to do? And I think it's the same thing in this area, but, it, but you just have to be intentional about it. Really interested to hear your thought about intention and how that applies to innovation. Yeah, I mean, that is a whole nother, you know, I could, I could riff on that for sure. hours. But I mean, so I, I think most companies have intention deficit disorder. Intention deficit disorder, that's <laughs> that right. We should, we that's, right. that's another trademark. That's going to be our, term. Term. Be our <laughs> new speaking term. Intention <laughs> deficit disorder, well, well, I, IDD. I, I, don't know, I don't know the exact right answer to that, or how to, but I think that there is an element of this idea, and there's this guy, Simon Sinek, who talks about first start with why, yeah. right? Because why kind of gives you that intention. Why are you doing something? And I think what happens in, in, in organ, I think what happens in life in general, whether it's organizations or individuals, we get so consumed by the what and the how. You know, what am I gonna do and how am I gonna go do it? And you stop asking the question of why do I really wanna do this? Yeah. And I think about this not Purpose. only at the corporate level, but I think about my own individual level, right? Mm -hmm. Why do I, you know, if I sit around and think, well, I want that job and I want that promotion, and I, and then you stop and say, well, why do I want it? Big companies, you become your intentions are about scale, it's about efficiencies, it's about um, economies of scale, all that kind of stuff. And so, if you're not intentional, because it's not part of your DNA, yeah, you have to be intentional about. It. He's right, about but you're the, right. He's right, right about the things. why. Because when I do reboots, you know, the people have from passion. The passion is about the why, and most of us in the heat of things forget to focus on that. I mean, my, my favorite why is this, where companies are successful is they've got this like mission up there. It's like, what is it? Well, we're gonna disrupt the leader. We're gonna create a new category. We're gonna reboot our business model. We're gonna reshape the industry. Or maybe we're just catching up, right. which isn't as vision. But at least people are rallying around something. There's a rallying cry, that's the why. I mean, when I was running AutoWeb before we took it public, it was like, this is the what we're doing and we changed it to the why. We're enabling people to take control of their auto purchase, which they didn't have back then early 90s, the whole online auto buying wasn't there. So the why is a huge piece. And we as execs, I admit it, I miss it a lot because you're, you're in the heat of stuff and it's you're, you're focused on the what and the how and you better have it ready by April. And not that year, this year. Right, right, exactly. It's um, tough, tough balance. Who's getting it right out there and what can we learn? In terms of looking at who's out there and how they're thinking about it, um, 
I, I like the way that like a GE or a Boeing is thinking about it to a certain degree. So a GE right now, you know, they've got their 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 marketing lead, who's also the innovation lead, this woman Beth Comstock. Right. She's got a direct line to to Immel. and so that kind of you know completely sends a signal to the organization this is important. How you protect the idea and the it, it, in its inception through pilot and then to scale, I like the way they're thinking about it. I think it's a really interesting way. And Boeing's trying to do the same thing. And the other thing I like is what Boeing's doing. There's a guy over there named Tim Noonan who runs their yep. venture group. And is they're thinking about, okay, they're not thinking about cannibalization, but they're thinking about adjacent industries. Yes. And they're saying, look, you know, we've got a lot of great patents. We've got a lot of great you know, talent and ideas and products that we can bring into other industries. How do we go do that? And again, giving it some protection so they can go do it. Um, how, what's the best model for setting up an effective skunk works? When does it make sense to, to do kind of a top, more top secret development effort outside of corporate headquarters, and when is it not a good idea to do that? How do you do it? Well, that's a, that's a secret. This is a secret, <laughs> right, exactly, right. But the Lockheed example, that was 1943, and yeah. Kelly Johnson basically said, we sort of wartime, of course, but we need a need for speed. Secrecy yeah. was a, the speed. second one. And they put a tent in the parking lot in California, I forgot what town, or maybe Irvine or something. And they were literally out in a tent and it rained a lot. It was just a messy, skunky, nasty. Yep. But those guys came up with the um, X80 aircraft that made like a record time. And many companies, if they just would replicate that, they'd be fine. But it, it's amazing what is it, how many years later that many companies don't. So it has to be very situational, very descriptive to, to decide what is the right thing for the culture. So in many cases, I, I like to just let's embed some entrepreneurial talent inside a group where there's a, a visionary leader that will protect them. So in Sonny's case, that would work with him. And someone else that will go unnamed that uh, we met with uh, yesterday, they couldn't protect them to keep them you know, alive. The yeah. program would come and fail. So in that company, we're recommending that they, they basically um, separate from the mothership. And I gave them specific instructions. I said, don't listen to the CFO about your puny little budget or, hey, we got room on the 12th floor for you. Get out of Dodge. It could be across town. Get some funky startup space. Ignore what corporate is doing. Get the permission from your CEO to have this much latitude so you don't have to call in all the time. But physically get away, mentally get away. Maybe get closer to an incubator. Maybe get closer to the market you're trying to serve. Yeah. Some of them are going to Silicon Valley. That's not where the market is. Yeah. It's where there's some it's tech. In Chicago. That's where there's some tech talent. Right. Well, um, yeah, New York would argue that. But. But in it, 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 that's a great example. In some, in some cases, at 1871, where I'm on the board, we have two corporate guys, Sunny's level, heads of innovation, that work out of 1871. They refuse to go to their offices anymore, which we don't condone, because it's not a, it's <laughs> not, we don't want a bunch of corporate guys there. But it's interesting. They're getting their energy, and they're feeding off of that ecosystem. And so getting away and giving the latitude. And why do you want to do that? Because every morning, or every Monday morning, at least, you want to get everyone together and say, um, how many times have you guys called corporate in the last week? Are they really acting like a startup? Are they kind of ignoring the mothership as much as they can? And when they need leverage, they need the cloud, they need the scale, they need the brand, they need the market mojo, sure, you can always tap into the mothership. But really, if you're truly out there trying to create something magnificently different, if you're not recruiting the type of talent that would go to a startup, then you're essentially probably not building the right team, and there's no point in having a scale. And, and I think what's, to me what's exciting about this moment is this idea that there isn't one answer. Right. You know? And it's sort we're of like... figuring it out. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you're, we're going to keep figuring it out. It's kind of like going back to... The, it's like saying, well, I want to lose weight. Right? Well, why do you want to lose weight? There could be a whole bunch of reasons to want to lose weight. You know? Right? Because you're a triathlete. And that's a different than what and the how. But you're going to go do it. Right? Versus I've got high cholesterol or I'm obese. And so that definition of what, why you're doing it is really important. And then you can go figure out what the right... So right. it might be, you, you may not need a skunk works team, no. depending on what you're trying to do. I would argue if you're trying to cannibalize yourself, you're going to have to separate it from the mothership. Right. Because you're not going to be able to do that. You can't, it's, it's just, there's just too much history, too much process, too many incentives to not cannibalize. So a lot of it comes back to why you're trying to do it, and then you can try to understand, then one thing could be skunk, but that's... Many, there's other things in your toolbox and different ways to approach it. So it depends. It, dep it, it really depends. does. It really Highly does. situational. Highly and situational. Yeah. So, you know, 
separating from the ownership is one, just partnering with startups is another, but giving the people the latitude to do that, that's a skill in itself. So you need design thinking around that. You need to be able to be trained on the vocabulary. That's how do I get these two together? When they first brought um, you know, Apple and IBM together in a partnership meeting, Apple is still a very small company, and, and they each kind of outdressed themselves. The, I don't know if you ever heard this story, but if you looked under the table, the, the half of the group had nice loafers on like yours, and half of the group had sneakers on like me. But it was funny, the IBM, like the IBM guys, guys were the guys that were wearing the sneakers, and the Apple guys dressed up. That's the worst way to start a partnership. <laughs> right. It never went anywhere. Go they were trying to like, you know, impress each other, act like each other. It's like, no, you want to leverage each other's strengths and diversity. And however it gets structured, Sonny's right, it's going to be a mess. It's not going to be one of my four square formulas. It's going to be whatever works for you and whatever your you know, CEO is going to allow. Hopefully he doesn't even know about it. That's the true well, meaning of a scope for it. Dean, this is the first time we've actually vid done video on the podcast, so I'm glad you like my shoes. I wanted to wear something special with it. Those are beautiful, <laughs> by the way, Sonny. I like Thank those. you. Dean, I don't know about this. It might have been part of the show. Yeah, we'll it could have been. Yeah. Is startup thinking the new design thinking? Is that is that indeed the future of how large corporations will um, create new, meaningful, purposeful things? Is startup thinking um, and this bridge between startups and large corporations also the future for entrepreneurship? You know, it's the, a lot of people think that the model of having venture capital fund everything might be broken. Maybe small companies need to start thinking about corporate venture funds as their path to the future. Um, are we in the middle of a paradigm shift for how things are conceived and made? Dean, let's start with you. That was a long question, thank you. Um, <laughs> so startup thinking is not design thinking. Design thinking yeah. is really creating a platform of vocabulary to actually get people more in sync, first of all, about working with each other, working with inside and outside vendors, whether they're startup or not, and becoming more effective at what we call innovation. It could be anything, really, just creating anything new or trying to fix a problem. So design thinking helps there, and it is making a renaissance, as we say, at the time. Startup thinking, or dancing with startups, or all the things that we do, um, could be a fad. Because 10 years ago, when I moved back to Chicago, if you used the word startup, entrepreneur, innovator, uh, digital anything, you were kind of scoffed at. So many of the conservative areas were like, oh boy, that's kind of risky. So now it's just on top of the world, right? And I think it is for two reasons. One is, yes, you need to figure out how to do what we've been saying. You, know, you need to be partnering with startups. The second problem is actually more more systemic for major corporations. Most of the millennials don't want to go to work for these major corporations now. They see the cool places like Okta, where I'm chairman. They want to go to work there, and they don't want to go to work for Northern Trust, for instance, mm -hmm. or some big brand, even if it's a Except company. Excellent. Except Excellent. Except Excellent. Except Excellent. <laughs> well, if you work for Sunny, you're lucky. So, so there's a crisis of labor there. So these big companies have to do two things. They have to make their environments more attractive and entrepreneurial. And that's just not like cool and free food and acting like Google. And a foosball table. And a foosball table. Right. Who plays foosball anymore? And they, but they, they, they need to be attractive so they can retain those people. But they also need to admit that we're not going to get them all. We need to figure out who our partners are. And a partner network, whether it's a startup or not, doesn't matter. So I think it's the partnered innovation that I'm really stuck on. And startups is just a component of that. And design thinking is just a way to help pull it all together. Sonny, what do you think? What's the future for how things are made? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a tough one because you, you don't want to get too <clears throat> boxed in with something that, that feels like a fad or just a jargon of the moment, right? But I do think there's a lot of legitimacy, whether it was design thinking or whether it's startup thinking, in terms of the underlying idea. What you know, the overall what you call it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me are what the elements that are involved in it, right? And so design thinking is that human centric and that's a powerful idea yeah right and so I don't, I don't care if you call it design thinking and anybody can label it and hang out a shingle and call themselves a consulting firm that does design thinking there are powerful ideas and elements within that that I think are applicable that are going to be um, that are going to that are going to be permanent in terms of it, their influence and I think with the startup thinking some of those one of the things I think is very important is this idea of learning velocity and this idea of iteration yes. and getting, you know, learning quickly so that you can act quickly. And I think that's an important, and that's what startups have. And that's what Dean's been talking about. You learn, you pivot, you change. And then big company, a lot of times you don't do that. So I think that idea, are you learn? what's the learning velocity 
within your organization. That's our third trademark phrase, by the way, of this interview. <laughs> Learning velocity. We'll get the lawyers on that TM. I mean, he's right. Like the, the, it is. The it's labels it. don't matter. I mean, here's another one. It's, let's just call it growth thinking. What CEO growth doesn't thing. want to talk about growth? Right. It's right. like, you better be thinking about right. growth, and you better be doing it, too. Right. So, I mean, you know, 15 years ago, it was re-engineering, right? right? I mean, or Six Sigma, or what, you know. And again, call it what you want. There are, there are important concepts in there that you have to adopt and then uh, execute a within your organization. It just helps you get better. And the challenge for any big company is the, the willingness to adopt those ideas. And the faster you can adopt them, and, and it'll help you adapt, and then hopefully win whatever market you're trying to win. And that's the fun, that's the, what's really fun to me about startup thinking, is this idea of iteration and learning quickly and velocity of learning, all that kind of stuff. And it's such a fundamental change in the way a big company may operate. But to be successful and to be sustainable, they've got to figure it out. Well, we'll, we'll close with that. And I think that's something to which we all can agree and to which all our listeners can agree uh, as well. Dean DeBias, Sonny Garb, this has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, we could talk for hours and hours. We're, we're out of time, however. Um, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, I hope our, our listeners uh, learn something as well.